when people are paying attention to you and you screw up, it will matter more. So I don't know why everyone is so upset. I, I mean, I do understand. I'm not trying to sound unempathetic, but I want to reframe. I'm going to reframe this for people. When no one is paying attention to you, you have permission to experiment, and that's where you're going to get good. Welcome to the Networking with Michelle podcast, the show dedicated on providing you the how-tos of marketing and networking strategies. Here we believe in the Jim Rohn quote, success is nothing more than a few simple disciplines practiced every day. Hey, good people. Welcome back to the Networking with Michelle podcast. I'm your host, Michelle Gomez. I'm super stoked about today's episode because if you've been following along, I've been really pushing the survey and some of the feedback I got was, hey, Michelle, can you do an episode on video marketing? Can you do an episode on YouTube marketing, building a YouTube platform, gaining subscribers and all this kind of stuff? So I am delivering on this promise, right? Anyone that knows me, I'm all about the people and for the people. So I am proud to present to you Roberto Blake. Roberto is a creative entrepreneur helping businesses, brands, and individuals market themselves effectively with engaging visuals and effective messages. I've been following this brother, I want to say right under two years, started out in a Facebook group. He's a big Gary V fan. Y'all know I love Uncle V. And I would always see his comments on the YouTube videos and all that kind of stuff. And then I heard him on Social Media Marketing World podcast with Michael Stelzner. And then just this past April, he had a chance to speak at the conference. And if you are a social media person or online marketing um, guru, you know, this is a, a big conference within the industry. So this brother is making moves, making moves, putting in work. And look, I definitely want to say he is a go-to person when it comes to uh, personal branding and creating videos. Some of the things that we talk about is, of course, we start out, everyone wants to know what kind of phone do I get? What kind of equipment do I use? Very inexpensive. It's very inexpensive to get up and running. Uh, We're talking about engagement. How long should your videos be, right? Facebook versus YouTube. How long should your videos be? We address all of this and more. And let me tell you something. This episode is not for the faint at heart, okay? So brace yourself. Brace yourself because Roberto delivers time and time and time again during this episode. Hey, I want to remind you, it's uh, Networking with Michelle. This episode is sponsored by Zero, the beautiful accounting software. I've been using Zero. signed up about a year ago, been very aggressive um, over the past couple of months. It's been working wonders, right? We already know tax season just passed. We don't want to fumble over these receipts and you know the stress that... (laughs) <laughs> you know the stress that taxes bring, okay? You got to get your business and personal financial house in order, and Zero can help you with that. So if you're looking to start, you know, maybe you don't have an accounting software program, maybe you don't like what you currently have and you want to try something new, hey, free trial, 30% off, hey, try Zero, right? So what I want you to do is go to michellegomay.com backslash X-E-R-O, Zero. X-E-R-O, and you can click on that link and you can get your promo code to get you up and running, okay? So that's michellegomay.com backslash zero, X-E-R-O, in order for you to take advantage of that. Hey, without further ado, Roberto Blake. Hey, Roberto. uh, Welcome to the show. How are you doing this morning? I'm doing all right. How about yourself? Good. I am so happy to get you online because I have been following you for probably about a year and a half, two years. Um, I don't know if you remember, um, I was in the lifestyle hacker group with Michael. I think I actually vaguely uh, remember that. Um, Unfortunately, so many people invite me to Facebook groups, and I think I've really only prioritized maybe five of them. It's so great to be part of these collaborative groups where people are posting information, but um, unfortunately, it just becomes very difficult after a while to keep up with them. Yeah, no, you're absolutely right, because eventually I jumped out of the group, um, but I've, you know, still catch some of your videos on YouTube and that kind of stuff, and um, recently I did a survey, and this is what my audience want. They want to know about video marketing and YouTube, so I was like, let me go back to the source and do a formal introduction, so that's why I'm so grateful, um, and, you know, like I said, I've been following you 
heard your interview on Social Media Marketing World. I know you just spoke at the conference not too long ago. So how's everything going for you? It's going amazing. Everything is going very well. Uh, people have been receiving the information. It's been helping um, so many people. I actually got to meet in person for the first time one of uh, my uh, fans that uh, we've become friends online. Apparently, in July, I gave her some advice for her YouTube channel. Uh, it was part of my series where I was um, reviewing a few channels and just giving them 10 minutes of advice. And she managed to grow her channel from 4,000 to 80,000 over the last eight months, which is tremendous. Uh, and she got really good at it, and she attributes a lot of it to content strategy, which I gave her a little bit of advice on, and search engine optimization, uh, updating her titles, descriptions, tags, just like we did in the world of blogging and the world of web design years ago before YouTube. And you know, YouTube is owned by Google, the second largest search engine. She attributes her growth specifically to that because she'd been doing YouTube for almost a year before that to get to 4,000, and she's just got an exponential growth. She's getting about maybe three to 4,000 new subscribers every month so she's well on her way to 100,000 at Silver Play Button. And the reason I bring this up and I put so much emphasis on this, and her and I shot a collab video together where we're going to talk about this, that should be coming out roughly around the same time as this episode of the podcast, is because people see larger YouTubers not doing this, so they don't believe that it works and they don't believe it matters. And yet, YouTube and Google employs the greatest engineers in the world. Uh, Michelle, do you honestly think that if something didn't matter, that YouTube would have a blank space for you to fill in in their website if it wasn't important? Of course not. I mean, that's why it's there. Yeah, they spend a lot of money paying people to make these things, so I would think filling in the blanks matters. <laughs> Definitely. So how did you get started? How did you start video marketing and then, of course, grow into the YouTube market? For me, it was a natural progression. Um, a lot of people ask this question, um, and I've talked about this like a hundred times. I'm trying to see if there's anything new I can add to this conversation. But the thing is, it was just practical. The thing about video is it allows you to be everywhere at once, and it's the next best thing to being in person. You're getting audio and visual, you're getting the nonverbal cues, and you're able to 24-7 have a piece of something that has your facial expressions, your mannerisms, your personality, and your information out there that's working for you 24-7, 365. So as you know, I've shot, produced, and edited, and marketed over a 1,000 videos of myself giving practical information based on experience and not theory, and that has helped me grow tremendously. And I started doing that in... July of 2013, I started with Photoshop tutorials. A lot of it wasn't even me showing my face on camera. It was uh, making Photoshop and Adobe programs, things that I were already good at that I built uh, a career around previously in the real world prior to doing anything online and making real money online. I'd worked in the world of online marketing. I'd worked in the world of graphic design and advertising. I'd had technical skills for, for years. I've been doing this stuff since I was a kid at 13. And I'd also um, learned from people and helped local businesses and was making money off of this stuff since I was a teenager. I'm 33. I've literally spent over half my life doing this, and I've been a creative person my entire life. So when I went to the internet, everyone was like, I don't know what to make. I don't know what to do, blah, blah, blah. I'm like, do what you know. Do what you know. I happen to be a computer geek. I, I uh, got my first computer at 13 years old. I was sitting there cannibalizing and upgrading parts for it by hand at 14. I was flipping stuff on eBay when eBay first came out by the time I was 15, 16. I taught myself code at 13. I, I, I've always been a nerd. I've always been a nerd. I cashed in on it. I commoditized information I had. But I tell you what, Michelle, if I wasn't so good at technical stuff, and I still managed to stumble into the internet and YouTube and all these things, that I would have been talking about Star Wars and Game of Thrones. I'd probably have a half a million subscribers talking about that, getting people crazy, stupid, excited about that. Because I sat there and I was making Star Wars and Game of Thrones jokes during my stage talk at Social Media Marketing World. The audience loved it. If you find the thing that you're excited about, I guarantee you there's probably – maybe a million to a half million people out there. There is as much of a dork as you are about it. That is true. Uh, I was watching 
Gary V, um, Ask Gary V episode maybe last week when he had the guy uh, Lincoln from yes Lincoln and his father from um, What's Inside yeah it yeah. started as a science a second grade science project of opening something and now what he has like four million subscribers yeah something like that I realized that like if I were a kid like when I was a kid I was obsessed with dinosaurs when Jurassic part came out, I lost my mind. If I were eight years old today and I wanted to be a YouTuber, I wouldn't worry about being a prankster or a gamer. I would have sat there and I would have started with a video about my dinosaur diorama. I probably would have like played with dinosaurs and I was a real dinosaur nerd when I was a kid. When I, when I, was, when I was like eight, ten years old, everyone was like, oh, my favorite dinosaur is a three horn or my favorite dinosaur is a T-Rex. What's your favorite dinosaur, Roberto? And I was like, oh, well, I like the Archaeopteryx because it was the first winged bird and I also like the Elasmosaurus because I think that's what the Loch Ness Monster is or it's a, a Diplodocus. Like I was a real dinosaur nerd. I wasn't in for this like, you know, three horns and long necks nonsense. I was sitting there while everyone was flipping through like, oh, I can read books. I was reading the manual, a field guide to dinosaurs. I think one of the biggest things about video is everyone worries about the equipment. And I understand phones are getting more sophisticated. I just got the Google Pixel and I love it um, with the 4K it's amazing camera. Phone. Right. So let's just do a run through about the equipment, whether it's a phone or just basic um, DSLR camera. Um, do I need a green screen? What do I need to get started on just a simple video? Either use your phone or get a $60 webcam, then get a $60 microphone. I'm doing this interview. The audio is crystal clear, and I've done this for my podcast and for my live streams. I'm using a $60 microphone. I could go out tomorrow, and I could buy like a Rode Procaster for $250 and not bat an eyelash. And guess what? I don't do it because good enough is good enough. And this $60 microphone, the only enhancement I did was I got a $40 mixer for it, and I got that years later. Uh, less than $100, and you've got perfect podcasting equipment. Theoretically, I could do a podcast by plugging a $60 Rode video mic me into my iPhone, and that would be good enough for me to put this on SoundCloud and iTunes, and the quality would still be perfect. I do live streams from my phone with that same setup, and it is perfect. It's just as good as the audio in my YouTube videos where I'm using a $350 microphone. So this idea that you need this fancy equipment is ridiculous. My friend Sunny Lernarduzzi, another speaker that was at Social Media Marketing World, she started her YouTube channel and got a video that I think has like almost a million views on it that she shot on a $60 webcam. Like really jumped her quote unquote career on YouTube in the beginnings of her online business that she built six figures around and a uh, yearly income. And it was a $60 microphone. She didn't even have a tripod. She stacked it on books. Uh, the live streams that I do in 1080p, I'm doing with a $90 webcam. So equipment is an excuse. Equipment is an excuse. Granted, there's a minimum threshold of quality, but here's the thing. The real, like, and this is not um, a death sentence for anyone who's an introvert, because uh, I'm an introvert and people don't believe me. You're on-camera presence, your gravitas, your charisma, and the quality of the experience you create, that's what a quality video is subjectively, and we all do things subjectively and emotionally first, and we rationalize them second. The minimum threshold of quality on YouTube from a technical standpoint is don't have crappy audio, don't have a messy room, and use some lighting. Use some lighting, and as long as you're doing that and you're shooting in HD, and the audio doesn't suck, and you're not boring, all will be forgiven. All will be forgiven. And I know some people that sound so simple and it sounds a little pretentious or easy for you to say with 200,000 subscribers, but look, you've watched Gary Vaynerchuk, you know exactly what I'm gonna say. Everyone starts at zero, everyone starts at bloody zero. So I, this, this idea of the gear, and I did a whole live stream about gear yesterday, and yeah, I have a lot of fancy equipment now, but I like the camera that I started on that I did uh, the far majority, 700 or so of my videos on, you could buy that for $350 today. And my videos quality wise on a technical level were competing with YouTubers already with a million subscribers. And I was doing that on a $350 camera and a $20 clip on microphone. That's it. So, and, and I still feel in, on some level that my iPhone success sometimes was shooting better videos than that camera under certain conditions. So 
I, I like take that for what it is. Equipment is usually just an excuse because people need to talk themselves out of actually competing and showing up. And the biggest problem I see in YouTube is that everyone does this for three or six months and they will tell you, you've heard this, Michelle. Oh, I'm working so hard on this. I'd make, I put so much time and effort into my videos and I, be, I put four or five hours into editing for nobody to watch and I'm getting so discouraged. Now I'm like, yeah, and if you go to the basketball court and you work hard for three months and everything, you're gonna get curb stomped and you're gonna get discouraged there too. But because people understand sports, if they really care about basketball and they enjoy playing basketball, no amount of losses, no amount of missing their free throws, no amount of getting fouled and punched in the face on the court is really going to stop them and they're just going to say, oh, I guess I just don't play basketball anymore. If they actually enjoy it, they'll keep showing up and losing every day for years and never make it to the NBA. And yet people whine because they never get a thousand people's attention their first 30, 50 times. And I if go back and watch my first 30, 50 videos. I sucked, but I didn't care. I wanted to make videos and I didn't stop because I didn't care. I was glad no one was paying attention because I just sucked. It takes doing it that 50 times to get good at it. I mean, some people are faster than others. Go back to Wine Library TV, watch Gary's first 10 videos. It, like, it wasn't that good. Like, I mean, and he knows that. And I, I, I say that jokingly, but it's like the first 10 episodes, look, if you want to learn about wine, they are great videos. But in terms of his gravitas and, and his uh, on-camera presence, the first 10, 50 episodes of Wine Library TV, Gary Vaynerchuk doesn't hold a candle to even what he was doing two or three years ago. And that was 10 years ago. You start somewhere. Everybody sucks the first year that they're doing anything. Ask anyone who's a musician. Ask anyone who's an athlete. And, and ask them about year one versus year 10. Everyone sucks. When it comes, do you think you should go off top? Just, hey, got the camera, I'm turning it on, and just from the top of the dome? Or should I take my time, write out a script, bullet points? It depends on who you are. There are some people who, especially when they're just getting started, they're lacking in confidence. And also, it depends on what you're doing. If you're presenting information, you might need three to five bullet points. You might need some outline. You might need some kind of structure or you could get into rambling and you may not be respectful of people's time. You may not be keeping things concise. So it just depends on you. Now, if you're someone who's very good at improv and you know your material cold or you're a subject matter expert, maybe you don't need a script and maybe a script makes you feel stiff and make too awkward and for me that would be the case i just don't do well with those things because then i'm i'm so much worried about getting it right on script and getting it accurate that i'm not thinking about the experience as much i'm not making enough eye contact i'm overthinking i might be worried about fumbling my words or pronouncing something right and worried about how that's going to be perceived or about how if that undermines my credibility versus just creating a quality experience where people will get it and they'll be able to use what I'm saying. So I think it just comes down to self-awareness and knowing who you are. Are you someone who benefits from a script or is it like me where that's going to create anxiety for you? Right. Because one thing I've learned when I do a script, I tend to lose my personality because like you said, I get so focused on words and articulation and all that's important. But if I do some bullet points, I'm able to, it's just a little bit loose in that my personality shows. Exactly. So again, and that's you and that's me, but that may not be Steve or Joanne in the audience. So I, I recommend that Steve and Joanne figure it out uh, and figure out what works for them. And that means experimenting, screwing up, sucking, and seeing what sticks. Because I think everyone's so afraid to fail and so afraid to get criticized that they don't realize that it's just a data point. It's just a data point. I like, you know, and this isn't a copy on Gary, but it's like, I love that he said this because it articulated something that I've felt since I was a kid. I actually like losing just a little bit. It's frustrating and annoying, but I'm a Star Wars nerd. And for me, that frustration and annoying, it fuels the dark side of the force for me. And I get, I use that anger productively. But it's also a data point for me to say, oh, well, that doesn't work. It's like a video game where you keep falling off the cliff, but now you know how far the jump is. And there's no real cost. There's no real cost. And so I tell people, fail fast. Fail while it's cheap. Fail while it's cheap because when people are paying attention to you and you screw up, it will matter more. So I don't know why everyone is so upset 
I, I mean, I do understand. I'm not trying to sound unempathetic, but I want to reframe. I want to reframe this for people. When no one is paying attention to you, you have permission to experiment, and that's where you're going to get good. You have ex- you have a, a reason to go ahead and do something because you can fail as much as possible because no one will ever know because no one's paying attention. And by the time you get good, that's when people pay attention. People think that some magical thing happens. And this is why people, by the way, why they do things like sub for sub or they beg for subscribers or they even buy subscribers to inflate their numbers so that they look like someone's paying attention to them because they think that that's some magical answer. Because they see, well, oh, well, so-and-so grew more after they got 1,000 subscribers or so-and-so gr- grew more. The tipping point is 10,000. So if I have that number, people will care about me. No, 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 no. No, bro. No, hun. That's not how it works. The work you did to get to 1,000, the work you did to get to 10,000 is a byproduct of actually getting good. The process, the the scars. It'd be like, hmm. Okay, people care about me because I took this selfie on the top of a mountain. It's like, okay, and then when you try and, like, you know, sell yourself as somebody who's an experienced adventurer, you are going to suck compared to the real deal because if you had just climbed halfway up the mountain and failed, you'd have actual life lessons and scars to tell a story about, and you'd have real adventures to talk about versus someone who just has all these pictures that show that they're an adventurer, but you don't actually have a substance to it. So it's like being someone who worked and like, okay, their half is big, but they earned everything versus someone who took steroids. It's like the power and the ability to get there comes from the actual work. I like have some small secret projects that I'm working on right now uh, from scratch and things that I don't promote uh, that people don't know about. And organically, starting from zero, I've already got like 4,000 people, 3,000 people paying attention to that stuff from zero. And it was easy and it only took a short period of time comparatively to the years it took or, or whatever to do that in other platforms and on YouTube and what have you because I have the experience and the knowledge to bring the bear. And that's why it means that starting something over, doing something new, there's all kinds of things that I, every time a new platform comes out, I start over from zero and I don't use my YouTube leverage to grow that platform. I do it organically. I do it natively because I don't give a crap about the numbers. I want to learn this new thing. I want to learn this new thing and later after I've gotten a couple of thousand, I can augment it with the YouTube stuff, sure, because business-wise, that's practical for me. But I love starting stuff from zero under a, a pseudonym or a name that has nothing to do with Roberto Blake. I love starting from zero and seeing what's happening because it means that stays real to me. It means that I still know what it means and what it tastes like to start from nothing. And that gets me really excited and hyped. And I don't get frustrated by nobody watching. I like learning is the, is the stuff that I know still relevant for somebody new. And it's why I can say that with confidence and, and people don't get that. I love it. I mean, because it shows proof of concept. And then two, sometimes I do kind of feel, because I will say we run in the same circles when it comes to some of the influencers and um, people that we follow. Sometimes I, when I'm listening to them, I'm like, are they out of touch? <laughs> Like, are are they out of touch? So I love what you just said, because it does allow you to stay within realm of, you know, the people that you're giving advice to. You know, if you're going from zero to 100, but you're at 100 to 200, is that same advice still relevant to the person that's starting or considering if they're still at zero? And sometimes I feel that uh, people lose sight of that that are, you know, above a hundred. And at the same time, the people that are at zero, I don't think they know how to apply those concepts when someone is at a level a hundred. But see, not knowing or not understanding how to apply or how to reverse engineer, that's a matter of smarts and talent. And frankly, if you can't do that, you're not going to be successful. So if you lack that ability or you're not willing to invest in it and get training, you probably are going to lose. It's the same way that if someone doesn't have the discipline to lose weight on their own, what do they do? They uh, like that's why if you don't have discipline, having a gym membership means you're going to pay twenty to fifty dollars a month to not do the work anyway. If you had discipline, you don't have to go to the gym. There are plenty of people who go in their backyard, or get on a treadmill in their house, and they drop one hundred and twenty pounds. 
because that's called discipline. Discipline is its own form of talent or a skill, and you can develop discipline. Thankfully, you can do that with hard work and mental fortitude. That's what discipline is. Thank God for it. Some people have more of it naturally than others. But the people who complain the most are the people who are the most lacking in discipline. I'm not saying they don't work hard. I'm saying that if they don't get immediate results and gratification, we have a culture that's perpetuated this uh, desire for instant. It, it's, we have a microwave culture. No one wants to actually take the time to learn to cook anymore. They don't res- no one respects the process, Michelle. No one, rese- no one respects the process. People only respect results, and results are crap. Results are crap. You know, I used to be a person who said results are all that matter. Hang results. I don't care about results anymore. And some people, especially in the business world, they disrespect that until I break it down for them. It's like results can be cheated. Results can be fake. You show me your process. You can't fake that. When, like, when anyone says – Roberto, you faked that and everything. It's like I say BS because tell me how I faked making a thousand videos. Tell me how I faked having the editing chops in Premiere Pro and how I faked, you know, 1,500 executions, probably 3,000 that ended up on the cutting room floor, bro. Tell me how I spent from age 15 to age 33 sitting and squatting in Adobe learning all this crap. Tell me how I faked that, bro. You can't fake executions. You can't fake knowledge that is predicated on producing something. Results are a byproduct. And so if your process is good, the byproduct of that will be what it is, and the results are uh, are the marketplace. But guess what? The marketplace – yeah, the marketplace decides, but the marketplace is stupid sometimes because I'll tell you what will happen. Tomorrow, if enough Apple CEO, uh, CEOs and CMOs and C-level executives had a scandal tomorrow – doesn't matter that they have one of the best products in the world. Doesn't matter that they have some of the best advertising and marketing in the world. Doesn't matter that the employees are smarter than they've ever been. The stock will be affected by the perception and the emotional context of people uh, distrusting the company based on distrusting the faces of the company if they had some huge scandal. The actual work that they did, the actual tangible results will be irrelevant in shareholder confidence, the stock price, and the way that people uh, react to it, which means that meritocracy goes out the window, which I hate, but I understand, which is why I respect the market, but simultaneously I don't respect the market because in a world like that, it's why everyone will um, be loved and will go to the party and worship uh, the loud, rich jock and the nerd that you know was scraping by and wearing beat up shoes and like taught themselves like to read in a shack or whatever and like is the valedictorian and work their butt off is going to like you know emotionally with people lose even though they worked harder than anybody they produced a tremendous uh result they have real smarts but guess what the perception of the emotional value of i don't necessarily love or like you or i don't relate to you see that's a thing that's a real thing and i understand it psychologically And I respect it, and yet I don't because marketing – and I say this as a marketer – marketing will beat meritocracy even though as a marketer, I don't believe it should. But I know that packaging, I know that packaging, I know that optics will undermine the reality of hard work. I know that somebody that – like more attractive packaging will beat somebody's content of character. I know that. And we try to pretend it's not true, but it absolutely is. It absolutely is. Now, granted, you can overcome that. It's not easy. It will be done by the people with talent. And that's my point is that if you have a good enough process and you understand that and you have situational awareness, you can still win. I see people that are not conventionally attractive win in YouTube all the time because they've figured out that psychologically if they lose on appearance, they can win on charisma. But you'd have to know that and you'd have to actually believe it and you'd have to be willing to fail to get there. Yeah, I mean, you definitely have to play to your strengths. Um, so with that being said, what are some of some maybe t- one or two content strategies that you can um, give to us? And do you have a publish publishing schedule that you adhere to on a regular basis? Aside from trying to get something out every day, I have a loose publishing schedule um, that, you know, my hardcore audience will tell you that I'm. I'm fairly okay on. (laughs) More than anything, I get something out usually every single day. But uh, as far as whether I adhere to my content calendar uh, strictly, 
No, I'm a little more chaotic than that. I'm a little more serendipity than that. And I just do what I want to do when I want to do it. And I say, screw it. Now, um, I don't recommend that for everybody. And you kind of have to earn permission on some level to do that, which I have with my audience and they love it. But uh, what I would say is for all the people who don't know what to do, find if you're in the if you're in the marketing and business side, find 10 pain points for your audience, your clients, your target market, your consumer, and solve those 10 pain points. Make 10 videos that solve a specific problem for the person you want to buy from you, the person you want to hire you, the, the person, or the person who would be you five or 10 years ago, solve their problems. Start with 10 videos of that and ask for more questions that they have. And believe me, people will tell you and complain about what's going on with them and you'll get answers and you'll be able to farm content from that. I take content uh, from crowdsourcing my community and asking them what they're going through or what's challenging them all the time. I take interviews like this, I rewind them, and I get nuggets of, I'll make a video addressing this thing or that question because it's a good question all the time, or oh, I've never been asked that, I'll turn it into a video all the time. So you can do that really easily. I cover this in my presentation at Social Media Marketing World. I'm hoping to get that video out for you guys in like a couple of weeks. Um, the I, I record the whole thing and it's an amazing uh, presentation in terms of how it was received by the audience because the thing is I say that um, not facetiously I say that because I know that it actually helped people I know that there like people in the audience came up to me and told me specifically that that was information and things that they never got before and they were stuck on how to figure out creating content. And I told them, well, you can crowdsource it or you can solve 10 pain points or you can reveal a process. I started with revealing a, a process for something in Photoshop. And it's not that it hadn't already been done. People get caught up on this saturated market nonsense and this originality. First of all, if the market is saturated, good. There's always room at the top because 95% of people, and again, I don't say this demeaningly, 95% of people doing anything suck at it. You know how many people play football? How many of that percentage of people who play football in the world make it to the NFL, make it to the, the, the premium soccer league and everything like that? How many of those people make it to college ball, let alone the big show? Okay, out of like what? Probably 1%, probably 0.1%. So there's always room at the top. Quality is the differentiator. Are you willing to develop a process that produces superior quality objectively and subjectively? Are you willing to save your cash instead of buying a new handbag or buying new Jordans? Are you willing to buy a $250 camera lens eventually to upgrade? Are you willing to buy that $300 microphone to upgrade? Are you willing to invest in yourself in the things that will produce and uh, produce a better end game for you on a technical level? And are you willing to suck out loud Get your practice. Are you willing to do what – you know what big-time comedians do? They go to dive bars and they practice their material and see what flops because they don't take for granted that they're a big comedian and that they're too good to keep refining their craft. And I think the problem that I see with podcasters, YouTubers, anybody in this internet culture is they're not willing to lose. They're not willing to practice. They're not willing to – they're not willing to practice. They will not put in their 10,000 hours. They'll put in 60 hours and say I'm not getting what I want and that I must like suck so bad or it's a loss. Like everybody that's big didn't suck. Go back and watch Michelle Fon's first videos. Camera's out of focus and it's blurry as hell. Go watch Marquez Brownlee, MKBHD's first videos. You know, nothing special there. Go watch the first Vlogbrothers videos. Nothing special there. I guarantee you that the far majority of people starting today are making better quality videos than the top 1% of people in YouTube that have – actually, it's less than the top 1%. Uh, fun fact, I don't think anyone's ever shared this data with you. As of the making of this episode, less than 5,000 YouTubers have over a million subscribers and less than 300 YouTubers have over 10 million. There's always room at the top. You're worried about a saturated market. Most of the top YouTubers are gaming channels, entertainment channels, prank channels. A lot of them are actually companies and brands. They're not even individual real YouTubers, and yet only 5,000 of them, less than 5,000 of them have a million subscribers. Subscribers, which means, and also a lot of them are beauty gurus, which means that if you're an education channel, there's plenty of room at the top for you to do a million subscribers. You want to talk about dinosaurs? I don't think there's a dinosaur channel with a million subscribers. You want to talk about space? There's only four channels talking about space and uh, and that stuff and quantum theory. There's only like four channels with that with a million subscribers. Okay, there's only maybe 20 tech channels 
that have even close to a million subscribers. That's it. And those guys all know each other. So I don't know what anyone's complaining about. There's plenty of room at the top. And if you don't know what to make, make what you're good at. Make what you know cold. Make what you love. You love Game of Thrones? Great. You love science? Great. You love makeup? Maybe there's somebody that isn't being represented with your complexion or with your skin allergy that needs certain products. And there's probably three million people in the marketplace that might have the same situation as you, and you're not serving them because you're not showing up and you're because you're worried about what everyone else is doing. People don't stay in their lane. When you stay in your lane, there's no traffic. <laughs> <laughs> very true <laughs> very true uh, i know 10 years ago when i was working at chase my manager would always tell me the cream always rises to the top the cream always rises to the top and i did not get it until maybe last year and what i've realized especially in this online marketing space is one the cream rises to the top but more i guess I don't know, more importantly, but people just fade out. Like people fall off and sometimes it's for good and sometimes it's for bad. And I think like that's how people actually elevate their brand. It's just staying the course and getting those small wins and remaining consistent and not worrying about what other people think or worrying about, I don't have, you know, I can't afford to buy this camera and et cetera, et cetera. There's always and there's always room for new players. And again, yeah, people fade out, people age out. We see big, we see big YouTube stars that have been around for ten years. Some of them are aging out. They like some of them have to change their brand. I mean, you think they're gonna be forty years old and people are still and kids are gonna still you get the you, got, you think these YouTube pranksters are gonna be forty two and people and p kids are still going to watch them sit there and pull pranks and everything like that? I mean, some of these guys are gonna get old man knees. They're gonna be able to pull that crap off. And by the way, no one's gonna be interested. And if they want to stick around, they're probably gonna be family vloggers or it's gonna to be like, okay, watch my 10 year old pull pranks now, and they're gonna grow their brand. I mean, and then they're just gonna cash in on their kids, and hopefully, they don't turn out like Macaulay Culkin. Sorry, Macaulay. Um, you know, you know, but uh, props on all of your previous successes. Um, but yeah, people burn out. We see it in Main Street. Like, where's Lindsay Lohan now? Lindsay, call me. Uh, like, we can, re we can revive your brand. It's not too late. Um, but no, real talk though. People are gonna like, people are gonna age out. I mean, where's Evander Holyfield these days? Where's Mike Tyson these days? You know, they're not in the boxing ring. So people are going to either age out or they're going to pivot and have to change their brand. And that represents an opportunity for somebody. And everyone's worried about market saturation. Yeah, what if Zucks had been worried about market saturation? Oh, I guess the, uh, Facebook, Friendster, Zynga. Oh, I guess I won't do anything. MySpace, guess I won't do anything and everything like that. Oh, I guess I just won't become the youngest billionaire of all time and build one of the top 10 technology companies of all time and change communication in the world forever because somebody's already playing in the space that I want to play in. So I guess since other kids are in the sandbox, I'll just sit here on the wall and wallflower it up and not do anything with my life. And, you know, that's that's what winning looks like, I guess, huh? So, yeah, that uh, like so I mean it sounds bravado, but that's why I have little sympathy for people with that mindset because you of course they're going to fail. M fail. Success is a mindset and success is a byproduct of work and if failure scares you, you've already lost. If failure scares you, you already lost. Failure is just a data point. No one beats a video game by worrying about failure. You 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 lose you get your extra lives in Mario because well you're gonna die you know you're gonna get hit by a fireball Bowser's gonna like you know whack you that's just how it is. So I got a couple more questions. Um, should someone create? I guess if they have multiple passions, right? Uh, multiple areas of interest, businesses. Should they have more than one YouTube channel? I mean, it depends on whether they can sustain in their stamina. Some people can play more than one sport, Michelle. Some people can play more than one sport and just and be just fine. And there might be enough crossover and similarities to where their workout and their training and their muscle grouping allows them to not uh, diminish their abilities in one area versus another. I mean, you look, you got triathlon athletes, you got people who can swim, bike, and run, and those all use similar muscle groupings. So it really depends if your audience is. Um, are all into the same thing, then maybe. And then it depends on what your goals are. Like if I wanted to uh, get a better view to subscriber ratio, I would focus my channel more. 
if that's what you care about and that's what winning looks like to you, but I don't care. My view to subscriber ratio sucks. I, I guarantee you if I ever get half a million subscribers instead of just the almost quarter of a million I have, I guarantee you I'll make videos that will still only get 3,000 views. And I don't care because I want to help those 3,000 people get theirs. I'm not worried about getting mine. If I wanted to just look good as a YouTuber, I'd be trying to get 10% of my audience every time. and I'd only make videos that get 10% of my audience to, to watch. Michelle, tomorrow. Tomorrow, I could implement a strategy where almost every single one of my videos, even with the diversification of the subject matters that I cover that I want to cover to help people, I guarantee you I could go to this format and this is where I'd crush it and where I'd get like 50,000 views every single video. I could just go and turn every video that I get ready to put out into a top 10 list or a top 5 list like Matthew Centorum, but for creative people the way I do it and it would always be 10 tips on shooting better photos, 5 tips on shooting better selfies, uh, uh, 10 tips – on ranking in YouTube, I would just make five and top 10 list videos, the same things that work in social media, the same thing that works in articles. I would just make click, click worthy listable content that's optimized for watch time and views and clicks and thumbnails and just put a number five and a number 10 in every single one of my thumbnails. And I guarantee you, if I did that for the next six months, if I did that the next six months straight for my content, I guarantee you that I would get probably between 30 and 50,000 views on almost every single bloody video. I know that for a fact as a content marketer in my bones. And if I go to my data, it's proven because nearly every list style video that I do like that performs in that way. And yet I don't do it because I do not believe that is how my market is best served. That is how I am best served. I don't believe that that helps everybody who has a very specific problem they're trying to solve. That will help my numbers. That will grow my YouTube channel exponentially. That will grow my ad revenue exponentially. That will help me win. And it will, yes, help some other people who do watch that content and get into my ecosystem, absolutely. But it will not serve some other people that will get left behind if I do that. And so I balance personally for my own reasons. I balance doing content that I know will lose in YouTube but will be a win for the specific people on the other end as a viewer. And I do that because I can't – personality-wise, I can't help myself and it's what I want to do because the reason people burn out in YouTube like we talked about is because they do exactly what I told you. They're beholden to the algorithm. They're beholden to the culture of YouTube. They're beholden to the marketplace, and they're beholden to the vanity of their views and not feeling like they look bad, and they attach an emotional value to their view and subscriber count. I attach no emotional value to that, Michelle. I think the only number that I think I attach an emotional value to is the number of what my age is and whatever is in my bank account at the time. Uh, and I, I think at some point I'll go to therapy and solve that last problem of my mood being predicated on the number in my bank account because that's still not healthy. But thankfully that number's healthy, so I'll live. Don't cry for me. But uh, again, that sounds pretentious. That sounds a little bravado, but I'm, I'm dead serious. And I think people have an unhealthy attachment emotionally to numbers. And I think that the vanity views number, though, is slightly more unhealthy than – my problem of uh, worrying about what number is in my bank account. But I could make an argument for at least that's a fiscally responsible thing, so it's not the worst habit. I still just wish that I didn't care about that number emotionally and I only did it rationally because that's where you really win. Where you really win is based on what is it that can impact and be a detriment to your happiness or what can make you miserable. And if the number on your YouTube channel makes you miserable, that's a really bad place to be in. If the number in your bank account can make you miserable, that's a really bad place to be in. You should never be beholden to those things. That's like a life thing. That's like a life hack. All right. So you mentioned the numbers. So should we com be concerned about the length of the video? Because there's all these things with these different platforms. Should a YouTube video be two to three minutes? Um, a Facebook video be 60 seconds? Or just pour out the good content and serve your market. Do you want the truth? Absolutely. So there's two, there's two versions of the truth. So let me tell you the, the thing that your audience wants to hear that is technically true. You want to know what length your YouTube video should be? If you want to optimize for watch time, if you want to optimize for watch time, make your video, if you want, if you want, no, if you want to optimize for watch time, the sweet spot of YouTube right now is 12 minutes. Watch, watch the YouTube vloggers. 
Look, and I did a deep dive analysis uh, on my own of Casey Neistat's YouTube channel, um, Gary V's YouTube channel, which has grown exponentially in the last two years. I did a deep dive of multiple different types of channels and different types of audiences. For your audience, uh, and these are adults in the working world, guess what? 12 minutes is the answer on a technical level. And they don't believe me, but I'll, I'll qualify that. There's a video that I haven't put out yet that'll come out in maybe two or three weeks, maybe by the time this podcast is out. And there are YouTube secret triggers in the algorithm, but this is a technical thing. And But the thing is, I could tell you this off of user behavior more than I could off of the data, but I have the data too. But YouTube used to be, tell you that five minutes, 10 minutes, and 20 minutes were how they qualified short form content as anything under five. Medium form content, which they actually don't even acknowledge as a word anymore, was just under 10. And long form is anything over 20. Five, 10, and 20. These were data points. Now YouTube uh, condensed that when you do an advanced search filter for something in YouTube when you get a result. And they'll tell you now that short form content is anything under four minutes and long form content is anything over 20 minutes. The average of those two numbers is 12. and uh, Matt Gillen, who is one of the leading YouTube analytics experts out there and has reverse engineered the YouTube algorithm and did this when he worked at Federator Networks across multiple channels. And this is where the 107 things you didn't know about Avatar Lost Airbender, 107 things you didn't know about uh, Who Framed Roger Rabbit. Uh, things like Watch Mojo. That's where you see all of these uh, videos like that and all these top 10 videos and like, oh, top 10 trends and top 15. That's where all these listicle style videos, they come to understand that one, watch time disproportionately matters in YouTube over views, over retention, over view to subscribe ratio. Watch time matters more. Getting 5% of your audience to watch something uh, within the first 48 hours is kind of the sweet spot for what they call view velocity. So in 48 hours, you want about maybe 5% of your subscriber base to watch a video and that signals to YouTube that it's uh, more relevant, but also cumulative watch time. Getting more watch time matters. You get more watch time across your channel and across videos and across playlists when you make a longer video, period. And even if say, well, what if my audience is young? Young audiences disproportionately binge watch, so still optimizing for watch time matters. Blah, 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 short attention spans, new study, where, like goldfish are uh, better than us, everything like that. That's crap. You want to actually, like, how long should a video be? How long should a date be? It depends on how good of a date it is. If you suck as a date, okay, I gave you five minutes, bye. Like, if if not, it's like, oh, it's like, you know, like, you know, like, oh, 48 hour date, you know, fine. You know, Disneyland, 48 hours, done. You know, I mean, so are you good enough to hold people's attention? I mean, you, you have a podcast. You've got people who watch and listen to, sorry, listen to a podcast for an hour. It depends in like in a world where we have the lowest attention spans. It's about engagement. It's about quality of experience. That's what quality content is. Quality content is, are you engaging? Are you, look, uh, that's why I'm challenging assertions throughout this podcast. And I'm, sa I'm saying things that don't always quote unquote uh, contextually maybe make me sound like the nicest person in the world, but it's also entertaining for one thing, but I'm not really hamming it up, but I'm also keeping it interesting and I'm challenging assertions because even if people are mad at me, they will listen just so that they can be combative more and so they have one more thing to hit me over the head with, right? I mean, that's how shock jock radio works too. So your content, if, if someone, like people sit there and there are people who binge watch YouTube videos because they love to hate on somebody. That's true and we know it. And we know that there are YouTubers that specifically make content to do that. And, and so it's a matter of practicality. So here's the not like so obvious answer. Make a video as long as it needs to be to deliver on the promise of the video and not a minute longer. Meaning that if you can get your point across in three to five minutes, done. If you can show something and you can make a valid point, one of my best videos uh, that people love is how to start a podcast explained in one minute. It's a one minute and 50 second video. It's a one minute and 50 second video that is a snippet that I asked permission to record where I was explaining to my friend uh, Rebecca Lima, uh, the CEO of Ment, um, which is a, a mobile app for airports. It's going to be huge, by the way. But like um, – Hashtag not sponsored. Uh, but like that was a that was a, a snippet of a longer conversation that will get released later. It was a two-minute snippet 
of a conversation where I was explaining to her building a podcast for her personal brand um, around travel and airport stuff as leverage later for getting more visibility on her app, similar to how Casey Neistat did his vlog to blow up Beam, his company, for his app. Um, I said you could use the same strategy with a podcast. I broke down how to launch a podcast pretty much in two minutes. And and it was like it was a it was a video that got a lot of traction. Um, a lot of people used the information. They used the affiliate links. They used the the web hosting links to get the stuff they needed for their podcast. And they're like, oh, wow, this is exactly what I need. And you get it more concise. And guess what? They then demanded and have asked me to do a more in-depth video and have basically given me permission to do a longer video because that would serve them. It's like, okay, that went my appetite. So the thing is from a content strategy, you need short-form content uh, around four or five minutes or less to give a low emotional barrier to entry into your ecosystem, and then you need long-form content to back it up to show that you have the chops. It's why I post an hour-long speaking engagement, and yeah, not everyone in my audience will watch that, but guess what? I guarantee you everyone in my audience would be served by watching a speaking engagement that I give for an hour that people paid like $800 or $1,500 to go to a conference to get that information, and I put it out there and I get permission because it markets the conferences too to put out an hour-long stage talk for free. The fact that all 200,000 of my audience doesn't watch that has nothing to do with the quality of the video. It is is Are they willing to make the emotional commitment to an hour? And I would make the argument that it's like I think it's a loss for them, and I don't say this arrogantly or facetiously, but I think it's a loss for them when they decide to opt out of a video because it's an hour, when it's a presentation that people have paid hundreds or thousands of dollars to get access to that information, which means that if they are complaining or they're saying they can't solve a problem or they can't grow their channel and they're opting out of an hour long of free information that I would charge them hundreds of dollars for on a one-on-one -on -one consult, that is the best information that I give because it's also audience Q&A where people are asking me things that I've never been asked before that I've never made content around before, when they opt out of that because they see it's an hour, they lose. If the information is good, they lose. And again, I'm not saying that dismissively or arrogantly. I'm saying that real talk, if you had the opportunity to see Damon John and you had the money and you could spend an hour with Damon John or Mark Cuban, I'm not comparing myself, I'm just using a relevant mainstream example of someone who has knowledge to offer. If you could do that, for an hour, isn't that worth more of your time than watching Scandal or Game of Thrones for an hour? Definitely, and I mean, it's a great perspective. But, it is. But, but I, I think the problem is, you know, YouTube is free. And as we say, you know, if you pay $1,000 for something, you have skin in the game, so you're gonna take it more seriously. Absolutely. Which is why it's still valid for, by the way, anyone in your ecosystem, anyone in your ecosystem wants to do a YouTube channel. I know what some of them are afraid of because you didn't ask me this, but I'll tell you. They should still sell an online course or sell an ebook, even if they're giving out free information because of that fact. Because the thing is, you know what's free? What's free is running around your neighborhood or your block and losing 50 pounds. You know what's free? Getting on the floor and doing push ups. That's free. It costs you nothing. You know what's free? Jumping rope. And people don't do it, but they pay $50 a month for a gym membership, right? They pay $500 a month for a personal trainer, right? Because then they're on the hook. It's accountability, and it's uh, something that is emotionally painful because if I don't do it, I wasted that money. If I buy that book and it looks pretty on my bookshelf, but I don't read it, I wasted my money. So you'll get – you'll extrapolate value from something if it's painful enough. And emotionally not to because you have skin in the game and it's a waste of money if you didn't. So the thing is, even in the summer, I'm going to be releasing some online courses around personal branding and YouTube stuff. And the benefit is a couple of things. And it's not, I'm not even pre-selling this, but I'm making a point for anyone in your audience who wants to sell something. Do you know what the value is of that versus my free content? Structure. Because even if I give you a YouTube playlist, at some point YouTube wants to get, to get views. So they're going to recommend a cat video that you're going to want to watch instead, which means that you won't have the discipline to get through the playlist of the stuff that's learn stuff and work hard, learn about optimizing watch time, learn about building your website, learn about building your personal brand, learn about being confident on camera, learn these tricks for writing a script, learn these tricks for editing. You're, you're, are you going to sit there for that for three hours straight and get it? Or are you going to, I need a break mentally, I'm going to watch this cat video, oh, and now you've watched five cat videos, or you've watched two prank videos, or you watch whatever entertainment, or oh, there's a Game of Thrones theory, whatever. Like, that's real. But if you pay for a course 
you're in the ecosystem of that course and it's like, oh wow, I completed five modules. You know what, let me get through another five today before I call it quits. You have that sense of I want to complete something. I want to get through the whole mod, like the whole lesson plan for today. I want to get through these 10 things because it's like I'm three in, it's seven more. Let me power through. That's how our brain works and that's the value of online courses. It's why despite all the free information on the internet, it's still valid for some people to go to college and I'm known for being the somewhat anti-college guy of like, Get disciplined, learn it on your own. But not everyone's brain works that way. I could go ahead and I, I was the kid who could – I went to college, by the way. But here's the thing. I learned stuff outside of uh, what my uh, degree was, uh, which I never even bothered to finish, by the way, which didn't hold me back from building a six-figure business. So that's why I'm kind of somewhat anti-college. I started my adult life with no debt because of that. Um, the, the thing that I am, though, is I'm disciplined. I will read. I will read 20 books in a month if that's what it takes to get me what I want, because I can read a book a day. I have that discipline and I can speed read. And I will also listen to audio books while I work out at the gym. But that's me. I was a track and cross country champion. So I have that discipline. Not everybody, and it's no offense, not everyone has that. And if you play to your strengths, if you don't have that discipline and you need some hand holding or you need some guidance or you need structure, you go to school, go to college, because it will provide that. It'll provide you a schedule and it will, a, hold you accountable okay so that's why some people need that there are some people that they cannot learn from free content if they tried because there's too many distractions there's no structure and there's no accountability and there's no cost but if they know that they shelled out 300 500 100 bucks they'll show up every day because they're not going to waste that money if there's structure and there's a checklist they will their brain is going to be tweaked to their especially if they're a type a personality they're going to get through that they're, and, and it's an elimination of distractions because there's not a – oh, it's not YouTube. So YouTube isn't trying to recommend things and trying to figure them out and trying to siphon attention from them. They're there to learn the thing that they're there to learn. And maybe it's a format thing. Maybe you every not everybody learns from video alone. Maybe you have to give some download PDFs. Maybe you have to give some templates. Maybe you have to give some audio downloads for people who learn that way. So I think it's valid. For everyone in your audience that's giving away free information, whether it's a podcast, a blog, a YouTube channel, I would tell them don't be scared to go to market and write a book. Don't be scared to make a video guide. Don't be scared to make an online course in like Thinkific or Kajabi. Just go ahead and give people the option so that they can um, learn the way that works for them. And some of them, they need skin in the game. Some of them, they need structure. Some of them, they need something that helps because they don't have the discipline. Help them learn. Like I hate that education doesn't play to people's strengths. There are people who learn visually and don't like lectures. And the thing is today in education, they say if you don't – if they if they decided that if you make up maybe the 30 percent of people who suck at reading comprehension, you've lost. Like Gary. Gary was a D student. Gary Vaynerchuk was a D student because of that stuff. Gary doesn't love reading. But he's – what four times <laughs> New York bestseller? Four times New York Times bestseller because well, he – Don't he let that limit you. Books. He, he didn't write them. He wrote them by speaking out loud and having it transcribed because that's his game because he's a phenomenal public speaker because he's a charismatic guy. And he figured out that like he didn't need to be beholden to that to not be a best-selling author. He hates to read, and yet he can write best-selling books. Like, so people don't realize that the conventional methods are conventional. But guess what? If you're an outlier in that 10 or 20 or 30 percent of people that doesn't work for, you didn't already lose. You didn't automatically lose. You still have an opportunity to win. And I think that that's a message that – I mean I know we went somewhat off topic here, but I think it's relevant to your audience because I think they're being told nonsense. I think they're being told all the reasons they're going to lose and no one's decided to help them figure out how to win and nobody's serving them. That's why I say I take a loss on my YouTube channel optically to the people who care about YouTubery things because I'm not going to be like regular YouTubers. I'm not going to pander to people. I'm not going to pander to the YouTube algorithm. I'm not going to pander to the YouTube culture. I already know those hacks. I, could, I told you, I already know exactly what it takes to win, and that data has been proven. And I know because if I look at my top videos, I'll go to it right now while we're talking. I'll go look at my top videos, and my top video is 10 ways to make passive income online with 666,388 views. Um, how to get your first uh, 100 subscribers on YouTube, five small businesses you can start at home, uh, Microsoft Surface Studio hands-on review, uh, Adobe Premiere Pro um, uh, color correction, 10 small YouTuber problems and how to fix them, uh, uh, laptop buying advice. I know what will get me a quarter of a million views on YouTube. I know what will get me 50,000 per video. I know, and I know people who've done this and I've helped people do it. The point for me though is 
Does my audience win if I do that? And that's me. Now that's not everybody's end game. Not that's not everybody's end game. And look, I like I'm not trying. I mean, I make a substantial income off of YouTube, but I run a real business outside of YouTube. I run a client services and consulting business around marketing and video production, and it has nothing to do even with my YouTube subscriber count because at the end of the day, I I shot and edited a thousand videos. Not everyone who owns a camera can tell you that. A lot of my presentation in social media marketing world wasn't even predicated on YouTube subscribers and YouTube growth. It was based on some of the things we talked about. What camera gear do you need? Settings. What is objective and subjective quality? How do you come up with ideas to even make a video? Using a script versus not using a script. Those things have nothing to do with a YouTube subscriber count. That has to do with practical executions. Telling you how to reduce the noise in your audio, telling you how to soundproof a room, telling you what microphone to buy, telling you what monitor headphones to buy, telling you what lighting works, that has nothing to do with a YouTube subscriber count. That has nothing to do with a YouTube uh, view count. Those are technical skills. I can sell and commoditize the knowledge of technical skills for tens of thousands of dollars. I've built a six-figure business around commoditizing that knowledge and information, not on YouTube subscribers and YouTube views and YouTube growth hacking. It's been mostly creative services and production and actual technical skills that people come to me for. I got you. Roberta, I love your energy. Love your energy. Um, I loved it. I was really looking forward to this interview and I appreciate it because you're delivering beyond video, beyond YouTube, just the nuggets of mindset and the importance of execution. And I believe, I believe people don't want to work and somehow that gets lost in translation, <laughs> but you just delivered, you know, results. Michelle, the 99, the 99.9% .9 of people don't, that's why the, that's why we always admonish and everyone envies the 1% because the 1% are enviable because their success is a byproduct of work more than luck. In a lot of cases, only the 0.01% of people lucked into that lot in life. The reality is that most people. Most people, they worked for it because everybody, everybody started at zero. Even if they had all of the talent and all the DNA. Do you know the most talented people I know are bagging groceries? Do you know that I know people that literally are at a checkout counter and are a store clerk or are working like at an electronics store or Best Buy or something that are more talented than people at Marvel and DC right now, more talented than the people who make like SpongeBob SquarePants or whatever it is and everything like that, more talented than Disney animators in terms of their raw God-given ability, but their mindset, and I, I, I've tried and I can't seem to reach them, their mindset or they think it's too late for them, their mindset is such to where they have all the raw talent in the world required to win. And if I had their skills, I'd be a millionaire today. I guarantee you. I, I, I guarantee you if I had half of their talent, that's all I would need to cash in on it because I have the right mindset. Anybody with the right mindset, you, me, with that level of talent would, would have seven figures in a heartbeat because we know what to do with it. And the most talented people I know with all the DNA and all the – look, there's people I know who were born into a much better financial situation than me. There are people I know who went to great colleges and started their life in debt with me. And it's not a brag, but I'm beating a lot of my friends and contemporaries in the marketplace on the optics of what people care about. It, it, again, what people care about in terms of what your yearly earnings are, which that doesn't really matter. It matters how happy you are, but I win there too. I'm happy. I, I'm happier than I've ever been in my life whenever I worked in corporate America. I mean, corporate America, real talk, I wanted to kill myself, literally. I had bad depression, anxiety, and suicide because I was so grossly unhappy, and yet I had the trappings of what people would say were successful. I had friends who envied me, and I'm happier now being an entrepreneur and doing everything uh, that I love and doing it on raw ability and knowledge and skills that I've earned over the decades, and guess what? There are people I know that had every advantage over me, and it doesn't matter. It's just like when I ran track and cross country, and I say this, again, not as a brag, but to tell everyone out there who thinks that they have an excuse or there's a reason why they're not going to be successful is that everyone could have every advantage over you and start with every advantage over you, and you could beat them through hard work if you really wanted to. It's why we all watch the Rocky movies. It's why we all watch Luke Skywalker go from knowing nothing as a farm boy to becoming one of those powerful men in the galaxy. It's because hard work 
can beat if someone has talent and they squat on it and they never work hard and they never discipline themselves they are waiting to get punched they're waiting to get punched and if you're in there bleeding and working and sweating every single day you can beat them you can absolutely beat them you can take the crown we see the champion get unseated all the time it happens every day nobody stays on top just resting on their laurels so you can win. I mean, Colonel Sanders was like in his 60s and he won. You know, D uh, Dave Thomas, like, I mean, all these people, uh, you have people with disproportionate advantages. I mean, Oprah was poor. Oprah was poor. Oprah was abused. Oprah was the daughter, uh, you know, of a drug feed. Oprah's mom left her. She was, uh, you know, molested as a child. Anyone who looked at her would say, God, that child has no future. That child's already lost. And she's one of the billionaires in the world. She's one of the most successful self-made came from nothing billionaires in the world. Why? That was a byproduct, not of luck. She had zero luck. She got the crappiest hand a person could be dealt in the universe for the most part. And she won. She won. There are people who are born literally on the wrong side of the tracks. There are people born in God awful third world countries with totalitarian regimes and everything like that. And they outwork and beat the majority of us who are blessed enough to live in one of the greatest uh, nations in the history of the world, one of the greatest eras in the history of the world. And guess what? People with nothing beat us every freaking day. Which means that if we're losing, it's our own fault because we're not working hard enough. And that narrative doesn't get stressed enough. So you could fix that tomorrow. It's called work. It's called discipline yourself. It's called learn the knowledge. It's called do what it takes. It's called do what it takes. If that means go out and mow lawns and then buy an info product or go to college or whatever, do what it takes. Do what it takes. Like, oh, if it means make a thousand videos before anyone gives a crap, do a thousand videos. Swoozy, Swoozy is one of the biggest YouTubers. He has like four million subscribers right now. He's up there with Superwoman. Swoozy did five years. I went to a panel. I put this panel up on my YouTube channel. And only a few people have watched it, just like maybe got like two or three thousand views. I put up a full hour panel where the biggest YouTubers explained what they went through when they got started. Swoozy has four million subscribers and he explained that he did five years on YouTube and only had 5,000 subscribers before things worked out for him. And it's not like he got a shout out or anything. It took five years for Swoozy to catch on and stuff was always funny, it was always good. The 5,000 people who were watching them for those five years, they knew what the deal was. And it took a while. And now he has four million subscribers as a result of sticking it out for like eight years, eight years. Uh, like. How many people do you think, even in your audience, if I told them that success was on the back end of 10 years of hard work, how many of them quit year one? Oh, year, month, month three. Right. Because, oh, well, I did 50 executions and no one's watching and everything like that. So you did 50 under executions. Congratulations. I st I've done a thousand. And guess what? I still haven't done my best work yet. I have a thousand and I know that everything that's going to go forward, I'm not worried about the views. I'm like, Michelle, I'll be dead honest with you. I'm thinking of, I'm like, I'm like, Wow. How am I going to accelerate the process of getting the next 3,000 videos done because they're going to be fire? That, and that, you need that. You need that. You're, you're like, why are you worried about – why are you just not worried about getting better? Why are you not worried about, hmm, can I make the audio better? You're worried about how many people are watching. How about worry about the experience you're creating for them in terms of I need the audio to suck less so that they can sit through this video longer. Ah, you know what? That was great information, but I didn't have the on-camera presence to communicate the energy and enthusiasm. Like, I love this thing, but no one would believe I love this thing because, man, I, I wasn't, like, making the eye contact with the camera. I wasn't smiling enough. No one would believe that I love the thing that I'm talking about. Oh, you, like, why are you not worried about that? You're worried about vanity? You're worried about vanity. Uh, uh, I hear so many people whine that only 300 people are watching them. It's like, yeah, I mean, I don't think they've ever spoken on a stage and seen what 300 people looks like in the real world. Go try and be a street performer and have 20 people to pay attention to me pay attention to you and, and like when I was a kid and I used to break dance and then tell me that 20 people is nothing go go street perform go read your poetry on a subway and then tell me that 20 30 people is nothing and tell me that that's not worthy of your time and effort and tell me that that doesn't mean something to you and then whine to me about your view count I mean that's that's real all right I know you said a lot but I gotta ask the final question how do you define success I mean 
success is what you decide it is for the most part. And that may be the problem in our society and our narrative is that people are making uh, their finances, their wealth, their material possessions be their success, their vanity, view, count, and metric. I think that people define their own success, and I think that that's why they're unhappy, is because the metric that they've sent for success is what makes them unhappy. I define success as uh, power and not conventional power. Real power to me is uh, the ability to control your time, control your energy, control your resources, and have some control over your outcomes. It's the ability to control your mind, control your actions, control your body, on some level control your environment, and on some level influence the people around you, not to their detriment, but to um, mutually beneficial outcomes. That, that sound, and again, that sounds a little hokey, but the thing is, it's very practical. It's very practical, and if you look at it, and you think about what gives you the most happiness or what's making you unhappy. I know that for me, what made me unhappy in my corporate life was a lack of control. I was not getting to decide when I, what I could put my energy into. I had no control over that. My energy was dictated um, in terms of what it was invested in to the benefit of my employer, not necessarily to the benefit of myself and not on my time and on my terms. I had no ability to truly decide when I was gonna wake up and go to sleep because it was predicated on what would create the outcome that my employer desired. So I had no control over my energy, my time, where my mental fortitude was going, what my thoughts were focused around, and that was soul crushing, that was devastating. I had no choice in working with toxic people that were verbally and emotionally abusing me one way or the other or uh, you know, taking advantage of me because those were my coworkers or those were my supervisors or that was my boss. I had no um, ability to stop that because my resources, my income was dependent on being in those situations that were not uh, healthy for me mentally or emotionally or even sometimes physically. And so that lack of control meant that I was unhappy and that unhappiness affected the outcomes of my work, the outcomes of my life, the outcomes of my habits, which meant that I wasn't winning. I wasn't successful because I was unhappy and I wanted to end my life. I'm, I'm not exaggerating that. I literally wanted to end my life because I felt a lack of control. The reason I didn't end my life was because I realized that I could take my control back. I could develop personal power and I had to ask myself if I was willing to do the work. And I was willing to do the work and I believed fundamentally that if I did the work, I could be happy. So since happiness was optional and it wasn't that I was fated to lose, I decided that, you know what, I'll stick around. I don't have to, you know, I don't have to end this. I don't have to cash out early. I could actually just put in the work and stop being lazy and be more mentally disciplined and focused. And it was incremental. It took time. It took time. And again, if I told most people that success is on the back end of 10 years, do you quit and do you cash out year one? And I came very close to cashing out. Literally. So that would be my answer is I define success as control and personal power. Are you putting yourself in a position to where you control what your time and mental energy and physical energy is spent on in a way that makes you feel satisfied, makes you feel satisfied, um, whatever that might look like. And are you in control of what your resources are being spent on? Are you in terms of time, energy, money, whatever? Um, are you in control of when you wake up and when you go to bed? Is, you know, I mean, that's real. That's the most practical advice I can give someone in terms of remapping what success is for them. Um, and, and again, it's also a matter of what your end game and your goals are. Ideally, like a, th a million YouTube, YouTube subscribers is not a real goal of mine. It's a byproduct of what I think is interesting to me because I think what, because the thing is, I think I've technically achieved this because not everyone who views will subscribe. But I have this goal in the back of my mind. Um, that if I could help 1 million people, it puts me in the 0.01% of all humans. If I could help 1 million people, even with one problem in their lifetime, it means that whether the history books count it or not, it means that I will know, I will die knowing for a fact that I'm in the top 0.01% of all human beings of all time because who gets to impact a million lives positively, right? That's 0.01% of all humans that have ever existed. No one makes that impact. So with that being said, positive impact. With that being said, plenty of people make that negative impact, but even then that's a small number. But um, that is a really good legacy thing. And I think it, like, you know, I mean, I'm making a joke, but I'm kind of not, but it's like, I also think that that definitely guarantees my entry at Pearly Gates. So why not? Um, so 
with that in mind, if I got a million YouTube subscribers, I would just use that as a metric for counting. Okay, I've helped uh, at least a million people in my lifetime. I can check that box. Time for 10. And like, and that's all that is. I, I don't need that vanity metric to feel happy and feel satisfied. I theoretically know that I might have already done that just because not everyone who is a view is a subscriber and I've gotten 13 million views. So it might be possible already that I've helped a million people. But I know that I've helped close to a quarter of a million people already. So, hey, one-fourth of the way. I've still got 70 good years in me. So that that's – you know, to me, thinking about your goals, but in terms of how do they make you feel in terms of satisfaction, how do they make you feel in terms of health? Uh, like I have goals and aspirations to do some um, filmmaking in the future and expand on that skill set and not just do YouTube stuff. I want to go and I want to follow around creatives and artists and show what the real life and the real um, world experience is. I want like, you know, there's a kid out there somewhere who doesn't realize that what the real experience of being a photographer, traveling the world, or building your own photography studio really looks like, and that it either might allow them to have the friends and family that they've always wanted, or that it might be a lonelier path to success than they anticipated. Somebody doesn't know that because the story isn't being told and isn't being told in an interesting way, captured for this generation in a medium and a format that they understand in terms of a documentary film. That, since that's not done, I want to do that. Somebody doesn't understand what the reality is of being a, a, a web designer or a graphic designer and really walking through um, a week in that person's life and what the day in and day out of that career might look like. And they, that's why they don't have a practical way or their parents, even that kid, their parents don't know what that looks like. And they're talking their kid out of that and telling them to be a doctor or a lawyer. Like they don't know what being a video editor and producer looks like or how someone makes a living at that. You know, they don't know what being an online um, personality looks like. They don't know what being a public speaker really looks like. I want to capture these creative entrepreneurs and these creative professionals. I want to capture what the real life is. I even want to capture what being a student in one of these programs looks like for real. And I want to do like, you know, uh, this is a couple of years out, but I have these aspirations that outside of the YouTube stuff, that I want to do these films and maybe it's a Netflix thing or maybe it's an Amazon thing or, or whatever new platform exists three to five years from now. I really want to do that. And they'll be me starting from zero again, by the way, being like, oh, like Roberto Blake, the marketer, Roberto Blake, the speaker, the YouTuber, oh, he's going to be a filmmaker now or something like that. And people will criticize me for that, just like they did with Gary when he went from you know selling wine to selling social media strategy. It's like, that's going to be a thing. It's just like when I went from the creative services industry to going direct to market with my own small agency and um, building my public profile, people criticized that. And then I won and I beat them. So the... Um, my point is that you have to go and you have to seek what makes you happy. I believe that comfort kills, and that's why I love starting at zero again because I like the climb. I'm a track runner. Running a track race, you're starting from zero every time, and you're only signing up for pain and sweat and achy muscles and your lungs exploding. That's all – like I mean I guess I'm masochistic in that way. Maybe I do need therapy because all I do is sign up for that pain. That's all I do. All right, Roberto, I am so grateful that you're here and you're making an impact through video and beyond. Uh, once again, thank you for um, being a guest on the show. Everyone, please catch Roberto Blake on Twitter at Roberto Blake YouTube channel. Is it the same or you have the create awesome videos? Um, so for you, YouTube, it's uh, youtube.com slash Roberto Blake two. Uh, I don't know why they couldn't just give me my Blake name, but fine. Yeah. So it's youtube.com slash Roberto Blake two. And that's the number two. You can find me in Twitter at Roberto Blake. Uh, if you want to check out my podcast, you can check out the create something awesome today podcast in iTunes, SoundCloud, Stitcher, tune in and Google play. Um, so if you want to get that, you can either go to Roberto Blake.com slash iTunes, or you can just type in create something awesome today podcast. So, uh, those are the places in social to find me. Everything is at Roberto Blake. And uh, just thank you, Michelle, for having me and for having a great conversation. Now we went down some interesting rabbit holes, but I think people will uh, get some value out of it. Absolutely. Absolutely. He is everywhere. Make sure you follow him. You need to be everywhere. Remember, I believe in you. Personal connection leads to an influential network. So thanks for networking with Michelle.